I thought it was Phyllis Diller. Uh, well, I sure am happy all of you could make it here tonight, and I sure hope I can stay awake for the whole show, because I sure am tired. I didn't get any sleep last night at all, never even closed my little eyes. I don't know what it is. I just can't seem to sleep on a strange lawn anymore. <laughs> Finally, about 3 o'clock, I gave up. And went in, I went into the house and I laid down there, but I tossed and turned the rest of the night and that's the last time I'm going to sleep in that washing machine, I'll tell you right <laughs> off. But maybe it's just because I love... Oh, maybe it's just because... Well, well, just as well I don't sleep these nights because when I was a kid I used to talk in my sleep and I think that might be starting all over again. Not only that, but Jeannie must have heard me because three mornings last week, I woke up with soap in my mouth. Here comes more tears to cry. Here comes more heartaches by. Here comes my baby back again. is so sexy every time he sings the frog in his throat does a strip tease <laughs> hey no you're a good audience later on we're gonna visit the jolly green giant and find out what he's wearing under his broccoli <laughs> came in from Interpol. 
Har harte klakte ture nu. Nur nu. Rach lach nur nu. You realize that Harry Nine Lives is in London. Harry Nine Lives, the cat burglar? Hey, Harry Nine Lives, the most wanted criminal in the world. I wonder what he's up to, the new. Nine Lives has battled the finest minds of the FBI and Interpol, whoever they are. But not yet cross paths with me, Inspector Buchanan. Aye. It should be the most baffling and challenging battle of wits. The world's greatest detective versus the world's greatest cat burglar. Oh, what a gun stolen from the most precious cat in my collection. Oh, dear, dear, dear. I can't stand to see a woman cry. Oh, oh dear. Uh, 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 <clears throat> now tell me, madam, was the wee pussy insured? Only oh, for collision. Oh. Have you got a wee footy of the pussy? Yes, dear. Yes, yes. yes, sweet. Oh, it's exquisite. Exquisite. What vicious criminal could have done a thing like that? A little something for you, my sweet. Oh, oh Harry, it's magnificent. Put it on me. I'm a cat burglar. Well, when I was but a poor urchin, the rich little girl next door had a cat. Oh, so beautiful. Little pointed ears, eyes that glowed in the dark. How sweet and playful she was. How she used to purr when I would tickle and stroke her. The cat was very nice, too. <laughs> To us. <laughs> this is Ian Wondergaard, your BBC Roving Reporter. The rash of cat burglaries by the inf infamous Harry Nine Lives continues. Last night alone, 38 cats and a pussy willow bush were stolen. <laughs> Let's find out how the citizens of London are reacting to this crime wave. You, sir. You, sir, what do you think about cats disappearing? Personally, I think Mrs. Cats is better off with Autumn. Well, here uh, with me now is the father of Harry Nine Lives. Tell me, Mr. Nine Lives, was there anything in your son's childhood to suggest that he would grow up to be a notorious cat burglar? No, he was just a normal boy from a normal family. Can't understand it. I suppose you're wondering why I've asked you here. Well, I'll tell you. All three of you are named Harry Nine Lives, but only one of you is Harry Nine Lives, a cat burglar, eh? Now then... Will the real Harry Nine Lives please stand up? <laughs> you see, Inspector, I told you it wouldn't work. You're right, Mr. Nine Lives. You're very clever, but you're not clever enough. I may not know yet which of you three is a cat burglar. But in time, I shall find out, eh? 
I shall observe your every move. By night and by day, you'll be under constant scrutiny. I will observe you until someday, somehow, somewhere, you will make one tiny mistake, one little slip, and you'll give yourself away. Eh? You can count on it. I'll find you out. One day you'll leave a little pool, a small pool somewhere, pool of water, something or other. Some little thing which might mean nothing to the untrained observer. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But to me, as great as you can, it'll point out clearly and unmistakably which one of you is a criminal. I am watching you, Harry Nine Lives, whoever you are. And you take my word for it, sooner or later, you are going to give yourself away. Yes. You watch out, Harry Nine Lives, I'm watching you. Yes, yes. They always do give themselves away, don't they? Yes. Yes. Caution, Inspector. It might be a trick. Don't worry, I can deal with that. <laughs> You're right, it was a trick. <laughs> responsible for the success of a lot of performers later on. Uh, major debuts on the show were by Bill Cosby, Bob Newhart, uh, Rowan and Martin, who later went on and did Laugh-In, and uh, Jay Leno, his, maybe one of his very first appearances, a wonderful young comedian by the name of Freddie Prince. A lot of performers, you know, that we gave a chance to go out and, you know, do their thing. Now, here's a fella you're going to be hearing a lot of. He started in show business when he was only 11 years old. He's one of the biggest stars on Canadian television, and I think he's going to be a great big star here, too. Ladies and gentlemen, Rich Little. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hey, have you ever noticed how Star's sidekicks always seem to be the perfect foil? I mean, where would Edgar Bergen be without Charlie McCarthy? Roy Rogers without Trigger? Jack Parr without... Uh, well, I was just wondering, you know, what if you kind of mixed combinations up? I'll show you what I mean. Let's drop in on a crowded courtroom where Perry Mason is about to wrap up a complicated murder case. With the court's permission, I wish to bring forth new and startling evidence which will prove my client innocent and convict this witness. Your Honor, I must confess to have cross-examined this witness longer than necessary in order to give my assistant, Paul Drake, a chance to bring new and startling evidence to court. <laughs> Paul, what did you find? Well, golly, Mr. Mason, I got to snooping around out there in Danvers. If I didn't find out that I'd done it, I just forgot to tell you, Mr. Mason. What about Rex Harrison, my fair lady? Blasted old Pickering, I, I, I suppose I could teach this, this Eliza creature to speak properly. But it's going to take a lot of very hard work, if not months, years. Now, you're a professor of linguistics, and, well, putting it bluntly, Pickering, I, I need your help. Okay, boss, I'll learn how to speak English my mother tongue. Oh, I just thought of one. What about Jack Hawkins, one of my favorites? Jack Hawkins in the Cruel Sea. Blast. Now I've, now, I've seen this kind of thing before, number one. I know what they're up to. As soon as they get within range, they're going to drop their flag and open fire on us. Well, I'm not going to give them that chance. We're going to ram them in about... Ten seconds. What do you say to that, number one? Ten seconds. That's just time enough for me to do a number. <laughs> boom, 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 down the garden. Where the red rush go? Down the garden, down the garden, down the garden. Here is a little scene from Mr. Roberts with, uh... Jack Lemon. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Captain, I just, I, I just took your palm tree, you know, your palm tree, your beautiful palm tree, and I just threw it overboard and it was smashing into a million bits, you know, right in the ocean, disintegrated. <laughs> so what are you gonna, you know, what are you gonna do about that? <laughs> Why don't we both try one of them puffy pastry apples? Ah, uh, can you think of any other? Oh, John Wayne. Here is a typical scene from a western. John Wayne. All right, listen and listen tight. You're a big kid now. Your ma and I have, well, sir, we've tried to bring you up right. But the farm's no place for a big kid like you. You gotta break out on your own. Strike a notch for yourself in this old world. Stand up to what you believe. You gotta get out of here, kid. Well, I, I've always been interested in the piano, Daddy. Ten cents 
to a party at Andy Williams' house, and it was one of those bring-your-own-ice-cream parties. So I stopped in a mall shop to get some food and food, see? And you'll never guess who I bumped into. Well, let me show you. Uh... Yes, sir. Well, I'll have a little rum and maple and uh, go easy on the maple. <laughs> Well, for heaven's sake, what's D. Martin doing in a place like this? <laughs> <laughs> Charlie McCarthy and Mr. Edgar Bergen. Well, I 
Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Dean. How very nice to see you again. Yeah, hiya, Dino. No, no Charlie. Uh, Mr. Rogers' name is Dino, not Vino. Well, I call him the way I see him. <laughs> Well, after I see the sap is running. He's always the same. Yeah. Nasty, all right. Now, gentlemen, gentlemen, now, please, every time you meet, why, well, you start bickering. Now, why not, I ask you, why not bury the hatchet? All right, and I think I know where I'm going to bury it, too. <laughs> You're not too funny since Jerry left, are you? <laughs> Try to get along with Mr. Martin. You know what? After all, old friends like wine is supposed to improve with age. Hey, I'll drink to that. <laughs> You'll drink to anything. <laughs> I said, don't you mess with me, pal. I'll cut you up and use you for a swizzle stick. Yeah. Now, you see, Charlie, if, if you show Mr. Martin that you could be a nice fellow, he might ask you to appear on his show. Uh, there he you know, thirty. He will never use me on his show. Why? Well, he just can't stand the competition. Oh, I see. <laughs> what competition? Mickey Rooney with slivers. <laughs> Did you ever notice, Thirty, when Dean sings? Yes. He, like Ken Lane's lips move. Oh no, no. <laughs> birdcage with a woodpecker. <laughs> Charlie, I insist that you apologize to Mr. Martin. Yeah? Yes. After all, there's only one Dean Martin. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. They don't make men like Dean anymore. No. After they made him, they threw away the shovel. No, no, no. <laughs> they broke the mold. Broke the mold. Yeah. Well, I think you've really done it now. I'm sure Dean will never ask you to appear on his show. Oh, I don't ever hold a grudge. I'd be happy to have you on my show. Oh, it's, it's very kind of him. He's a big man. Yes, he is. I'm glad to have you anytime, Edgar. You and Mortimer Sneer. <laughs> I told you he was a think. Oh, now, where? <laughs> started long. <laughs> now I play by ear. <laughs> no one had ever left in mistakes on a variety show. They ended up on the cutting room floor, and then years later, they dug them off the cutting room floor, and they started selling them as goofs. We left them in the show. That was part of the fun. I guess maybe we created that whole idea of, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, what's it called? Something, something, outtakes. You see the whole show? Hey, I didn't see any of it. And why did you tell me it was a great show? <laughs> Look. Blue what? <laughs>
Center. Hi, Ken. Hi, Dave. Did you see the whole show? I didn't see any of it. Then why did you tell me it was a great show? How do you think I keep my job? <laughs> That's what you forgot? Two guys, 240,000 miles up to the moon, and he can't even get a girl up to his apartment. <laughs> At first she hugged me, strangers in the night, and then she mugged me. <laughs> words of Richard Nixon, who once said to his dog, I told you a million times, not on the rug, on the New York Times. <laughs> through here. Oh, right. Hey, Governor, what's going on here? Well, what's this? Well, we're putting a new freeway right through here. Nothing ever goes on here anyway. <laughs> but you're the governor. What are you doing with uh, working with the highway crew like that? What are you doing? I like to think of myself as the middle-of-the-road Republican. <laughs> Getting interested in politics lately, do you think there might be some kind of job in the state government that would be suitable for a man of my qualifications? Oh, Dean, I'm sorry. We already have a director of the Alcoholic Beverage Control. <laughs> the hall, and I just thought you might get thirsty in here, you know, seeing this. You all know Pat Boone. I guess you all know Pat Boone. What are you yeah. putting me on? Oh, God. Oh, God. He's on television every morning, you know, and he's the Johnny Carson of the corset crowd. <laughs> Wonder what's gonna fly out now.
Yeah, six people look for them all over. Fifteen years I tried to get them sound to eat. Then all the time kitchen closed. Now kitchen open, people disappear. <laughs> oh. Hey, you look familiar to me. I look familiar? Hey, you look familiar. Don't make fun the way I talk, son. The gun I step with your foot. I'm Dean Martin. You're Dean Martin. Very nice to meet you. My name is Fung. Fun? Yeah. Bad night, Fun. Well, I got to go now. Look for those sick people. So long. Oh. Yes, Jack Flynn. Jack Flynn. Number one. Some kind of man. Just want to say. Well, Dean, I have to warn you that anything you say may be held against you. Sophia Loren. surprise you. Well, I'm delighted. I, 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 I had Jack, but you're you're too expensive. A guest star for me, like I can't afford a guest star like you, Gene. Hey, look at I don't want any money from you. Hmm. You're too good a friend. I'm here for free. Oh, Jack, that's wonderful. Look at that. think it really think think nothing of it. Oh. Wow. <laughs> them around you'll find my reason is logically sound who's gonna know that you pass them around a hundred years from today Crave a penthouse that's fit for a queen. You're near heaven on Mother's green. If you had millions, what would they all mean? A hundred years from today. Make love the thing Be happy while you may There's always one Beneath the sun Who's bound to make you feel
Remember, darling, we won't see it shine. football star from Temple University, but he gave that up to go into show business. Then he quickly became one of the most talented of the new comedians. And this season, he's turned into a fine actor. As you well know, if you watch him every Wednesday night, right here on NBC in his series, I Spy, Mr. Bill Cosby. Thank you. appreciate that, old-timer. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about karate. You see, there are over 23 million karate schools in Greenwich Village, which is where I come from. Now, I hear a lot of you laughing out there because a lot of people travel 800, 900 miles just to come into Greenwich Village looking for the weirdos. <laughs> Hello, sir. What are you looking for? I have started looking for the weirdos. <laughs> but what you don't realize is the weirdos are the people that have traveled 800, 900 miles. And then they're looking for something weird. But after you've graduated from a karate school, there's no better feeling in the world than when you're walking around knowing that you can wipe out your whole neighborhood. <laughs> That's right. People invite you out to parties. The hostess will look around and kill it. <laughs> but you just can't go right out and... Did you bring this fly in here on me? Just to get out of here, fly. Now, what you have to do right away is you have to start to condition your hand, hammering away at a piece of wood or a brick. Wham! Until a big slab of callus forms at the side of your hand. See, your hand starts to look like a foot. See, now, don't giggle. This is good because you keep your hand in your pocket for about nine days, and if some guy attacks you, you take a swing at him, and even if you miss, the smell will kill him. See, <laughs> you want more? No. Now, you're ready to break a brick or a stick. You just break a brick, <laughs> stick, <laughs> that's cool. Because if you're walking around, some guy puts a gun in your back, says, give me your dough. You just turn around, break a brick, <laughs> stick, <laughs> and give him your money, you know. <laughs> That's all you've learned. He was, thanks for the dough in the show, fella. Get out of here. Get out. Now, a big thing also about karate, when you break anything, you must give off a loud shout. See? It's, hey! Pa! Ha! Back! See? The shout causes your glands to secrete, see, and your froth around the mouth, and you look weird, and if you bite anybody, he figures he's dead anyway, see. <laughs> so, what you have to do, I figure, you know, why bother going out and, and learning how to break bricks and sticks if I know the shout? So, I went home and I practiced the shout in front of the mirror. 
Because I figure, if a guy's going to hold me up, where is he? Down a dark alley. Why? Because he's scared. That's why. Here I come down a dark alley. Why? Because I'm stupid. <laughs> but I know the shout. And the guy will put a gun in my back, he give me your dough. I just turn around quick. <laughs> Sit here, take the gun. What the heck's wrong with you? You some kind of nut or something? Say, if you don't watch yourself, I'll shout again. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, you give me your dough. I held up over 13 people last year, dog. <laughs> last but not least, in order to use your karate, you've got to have somebody to pick on you. See, now, if you just walk around looking like a karate master, nobody's going to pick on you. So if you want somebody to pick on you so you can wipe them out, you got to look passive. See? <laughs> Walk passive. Look passive. Talk passive. Hello there. How are you? Nice to see you. Somebody will pick on you. Guy, watch me bust him. Hello there. How are you? He'll come up when he throws the first punch. Duck it. Then grab both lapels of his jacket. Drive your forehead through his. <laughs> then passively grab his left arm. Rip it off. <laughs> grab his left leg. Rip that off. Then you beat him in the head with both of them. And you grab him and you put him in the ball and you throw him down and you jump on him and you mash him through the sewer and you pull him back out and you dump him down again and then you walk away and <laughs> Ann Margaret was a guest on the show. Now, Ann Margaret is about as close as you're going to get to having an X-rated television show with <clears throat> everybody fully clothed, no language of any kind, shape, or form. Boy, do you, do you look great. Why can't General Motors come out with a body like that, huh? How do you do it? Well, actually, I owe a lot to the 5VX, you know, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force exercises. Oh, I knew a girl who used to do those. She was built like a brick airport. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, Dean, you may not how important your body really is. Are you kidding? I wouldn't go any place without it. <laughs> now, for instance, on the dance floor, what would I do if I ever let my body go? Gee, I, I'd be <laughs> happy to hold it for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't you do any exercises, Dean? Just elbow bends, you know. <laughs> But hey, hey, what's what's so special about those, uh, you know, Air Force exercise? What's so great? Huh? Well, the 5VX builds physical fitness gradually. Exercise is programmed so that every muscle in the body is eventually developed to its full potential. You see, with the 5VX, you do it once a day, every day for 11 minutes. Hey, you got to be in good shape before you can even start that, huh? <laughs> Let me show you my program of exercises. Okay. First of all, I do like a minute of this. Then I do a couple minutes of this. Yeah, that should be. That. Mean. Then I do a little bit of this. What's wrong with that? That. That. No. That. And, uh, see... I've given my whole body a workout. Mine, too. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure that this works for men, too? Well, sure. Oh, I'll show you. Our flight left to the McDonald. Would you show Mr. Martin the exercises, please? Certainly, ma'am. Thank you. Now, 
Those two gentlemen back there are my construction crew. Usually they get along pretty well, but now they're going to show you what happens when two guys who've been working together for years stop working on a job and start working on each other's nerves. Time for lunch. Certainly knows how to live, doesn't he? We better not take too long for lunch. I got a feeling we're getting a little behind on this job. What makes you say that? Well, all I know is the painters are going to be here tomorrow. Here. For you. What's this? Open it up and see. <laughs> Don't throw away the wrappings. I save it. <laughs> oh, just what I've always wanted, a Spiro Agnew wristwatch. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, they're really different. They don't tell time, they ask. <laughs> How come you're giving me a present? It's a special occasion. We started working together as a team exactly 12 years ago today. It's our anniversary. <laughs> our anniversary? Yeah, remember how we met? You dropped your crowbar and I picked it up. <laughs> yeah, and then you used it to carve our initials on a hippie. <laughs> oh, sure, the old days, weren't they? There's something on your mind, Vince. <laughs> I'm out with it. What's bugging you? All right, Remo. <laughs> I didn't want to bring this up, but you are forcing me to say this. Say what? The magic has gone out of our relationship. You know something? That's the trouble with you, Vince. You buy a guy a couple of beers and you think you own him. <laughs> hey, anyway, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm sorry. Please, I can stand anything but your pity. Vince. Don't touch me. <laughs> Just remember, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even be around. I haven't the faintest idea of what you're talking about. Well, what about when I saved your life? Remember the other day you were on the fourth floor and you fell off? Lucky for you, I was on the ground floor, and in the nick of time, I pushed that fat lady under you. <laughs> I knew sooner or later you'd throw that up to me. Doesn't it make any difference to you that her girdle snapped and I ended back up on the eighth floor? Vince, listen, it, it, it's been no picnic being around you, especially the way you let yourself go lately. Well, that's really something. Coming from a guy who wears orthopedic overalls. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of having to cover up for your sloppy work. You can't even catch a ribbon anymore. Charlie Colucci likes the way I catch rivets. Come <laughs> <laughs> time we get into an argument, you bring up this guy you went to sheet metal school with. I tell you, Vince, I'm fed up. Okay, we're through. Mr. Vincent Groman? Yeah. Candy Graham. I wonder who it's from. Read the card. <laughs> you remember. <laughs> Thank you.
listen to you forever, and I am not kidding. I could listen to you forever. Works out perfect. You listen to me, and I'll listen to you. All right. And all of you listen to us. I would get a start out of the blue. Thank you. 
show this year, which is only appropriate because I was always smashed on the winter show. <laughs> you think like it. I wrote all that. I thought he's, a, he's about the wildest, funniest man I've ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Marty Feldman. send it away. You know how attached you get to them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it tame? Up to a point. Yes. What is it? Well, to be frank, I'm not quite sure. I looked him up in the standard book of British birds. He wasn't in there. I looked him up in the cattle breeder's guide. He wasn't there neither. I finally found him in the book of Revelation. getting a bit restless in the basket. I think he wants to go out and go walkies. Oh, uh, do you think I ought to let him out and uh, have a scam? No, 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 no. No. Look, right in there. You're probably quite right. He might only disgrace himself. Besides, there's all the, uh, the lava of unchaining him, as it were. Why have you brought him to the vet? Oh, well, I think he's got a touch of beacon hoof. Beacon hoof? Yes, he's been off his food lately. He won't touch his dindins. Oh, what on earth do you feed him on? Oh, he's not particular. He likes owls. Owls? Yeah. But, uh... Look at him, look. Look at him ruffle up his scales when I say owls. Look at his little red eye glistening. Ah. Who's going to have... from him, you know, or a clutch. Yes, I put him out the stud. Only none of the animals I've introduced him to seem that keen. You see, you see, that's it. He wants his dindins. And I have come out without an owl about me. Uh, you don't happen to have an owl about your person you don't want, do you? No, I'm afraid I don't happen to have one with me, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want that budgerigar? <laughs> yes, yes, I suppose you do. 
Anyway, it's not a good idea for him to have sex between meals. What? It's a bit playful this time of year. Next. <laughs> 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 you got a bit restless, you see. No, oh, no, please go on. Oh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> don't take this on him. He don't know the first thing about them. <laughs> NBC hired a producer who was a really nice guy who was under the impression that the Dean Martin Variety Show should sort of follow what the Ed Sullivan Variety Show was. So what he did was, for the first five weeks, he booked uh, Tanya the Elephant, a couple of jugglers, and a little monkey someplace somewhere along the way. And the show was not terribly successful the first four or five weeks, and... Um, this guy lost his job. I was the original director of the show. They started looking around for other directors and for about four or five weeks. And meanwhile, I was directing and producing, and I got rid of the elephants and the monkeys. And we also had a couple of uh, puppets in there in the middle of this. And we suddenly started saying, wait a minute, let's get some performers. Let's get some girls. Let's surround Dean. And that's what we did. And so eventually... It evolved into the Dean Martin Show, starring Dean, without Tanya the Elephant, without the monkeys, and a lot of girls. And Dean once said to me, hey, pal, I really like the girls. You know, you know what the guys are saying over at the bar in Steubenville, Ohio? Hey, where are the girls, pal? And he kept encouraging me. And the more he encouraged me, the more girls I brought on. Here we go again, here we go again, at the very end of the show. But here's a thought or two we'd like to throw at you, before we have to go. Thank you. Uh, you can bring the luggage up later. Uh, uh, doctor, doctor, Mr. Clemens is here to see you again. Clemens, Clemens. Yes, that, that, yes. that name sounds familiar. Yes, he's the one that thinks he's always being followed. Oh, yes, that weirdo. Well, send him in. Yes. Oh, Mr. Mr. Clemens, you can come in now. Thank you. <laughs> well, here we are. Aloise. Man and wife, our honeymoon night at last. Yes. Well, Ralph, there's there's something I've been meaning to 
to talk to you about. Well, what is it, sweetheart? Too many marriages today are ruined by physical problems, you know, and I just don't want that to happen to us, so, so I think there should be absolutely no love in our marriage. No love? Gee, I don't know. <laughs> believe, believe me, darling, it's for our own good. If we keep our marriage platonic, we'll be much happier. Oh, all right. Let's shake on it. Oh, not tonight, darling. It's such a headache. Stole your purse. Yes. I, I never even touched her purse. Yeah, that's what you say. What's your name? Uh, Charlie Harris. You have an identification? Yeah. I think I have something. <laughs> I sure want to thank all my wonderful guests tonight for joining us. There's no R in joining, joining. Oh, boy. And I hope you'll all be back with us next week. We're going to have some great talent on the show. And don't you forget to look on in. In the meantime, you just keep all them cards and letters coming in, folk. And this week, I sure want to thank that sweet lady from Encino who sent me those opera glasses. Only one trouble, they spill more than they hold. <laughs>